It is my great honor today to be welcoming as our distinguished guest, Ambassador Koji Tomita, who will be joining me today for a discussion on US-Japan cooperation and the future of the Indo-Pacific. Ambassador Tomita has served as a Japanese diplomat for over four decades. He's been the Japanese ambassador to the United States since 2020. Before serving as ambassador to the United States, he was ambassador to South Korea, and he served as ambassador to Israel from the years 2015 to 2018. Since his appointment as ambassador to the United States, we've seen many significant developments in US-Japan relations. Responding to crises around the world, including the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and most recently, the tragic events in Israel, which are a key topic of diplomacy. Prime Minister Kishida and Foreign Minister Kamikawa have both condemned the attack by Hamas on Israel and asked all parties to exercise maximum restraint. As a country deeply committed to peace and human security and economically reliant on oil from the Middle East, Japan also is following this international crisis closely. We are especially grateful in this difficult period to have the ambassador coming to join us when there are so many demands on his time. He is a leading expert on all topics of diplomacy and has a deep commitment and lifelong engagement with the United States. When Ambassador Tomita was only 19 years old, he spent a year study, studying at Davidson College in North Carolina. As Director General of the North American Affairs Bureau in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he oversaw the preparation for former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's official visit to the United States in 2015, which included a public address at the Institute of Politics here at Harvard University at the Kennedy School. As an extraordinary diplomat, he is also unusual in standing as a scholar. Ambassador Tomito, in addition to his busy obligations as a diplomat, has published two books on British prime ministers in Japanese. One on Margaret Thatcher, The Iron Lady Who Changed Politics, published by Shinchosha in 2018, which received the Yamamoto Award in 2019. He also published a book on Winston Churchill, on leadership in crisis. We are so honored to have you here today to help uh, us understand many of the important issues for U.S.-Japan relations. Today's uh, talk will be a loosely structured conversation between myself and Ambassador Tomita. Our event is uh, co-sponsored by the Edwin O. Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies, the Harvard Kennedy School Japan Caucus, the Harvard Undergraduate Japan Policy Network, and Japan Society of Boston. We will be talking for about 30 minutes and then open up to questions from the audience. And to those who are joining us online, we will be able to take uh, one or two questions from the online audience as well. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Koji Tomita. You have now served as ambassador to South Korea, the United States, and made many valuable contributions to trilateral cooperation, which is perhaps one of the most difficult issues for Japanese foreign policy. And we've seen great progress in recent years. And I'd like to ask you about this. What is your view of what we can expect after President Biden has hosted Prime Minister Kishida, President Yoon at Camp David and had an important leadership declaration. Do you see the Camp David summit as marking a turning point in Japan-South Korea relations? What do you see as the next steps that would help deepen trilateral cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and Japan? Okay, thank you very much. And before I answer the question, I, I like to express my deep gratitude to you, Christina, and the university for you know, allowing me uh, to be part of this this very uh, um, occasion. And uh, it's always uh, a great pleasure to to be able to come back to to 
of the, the ambience. So I appreciate the very deep connection that exists between these things. Uh, last uh, three uh, foreign ministers are all Harvard graduates. So I've been working for Harvard Almanac uh, for the past uh, several years. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, turning to, to your question, uh, Trilateral Summit, uh, is it a turning point? Uh, uh, the short answer is yes. And, um, um, but uh, the idea of the Trilateral Summit was actually in conversation uh, almost as soon as this administration years ago. Uh, at that time, idea was uh, the uh, American government uh, offering good office, uh, improvement of bilateral relations between Japan and hey, well, you know, the relations have been going through a very difficult patch. Uh, but uh, uh, we we um, ask them to be uh, uh, cautious because, from our perspective, um, I think those issues can only be resolved. And uh, I think U.S. support uh, for the improvement of relations is very much welcome, but it. We felt it's a little bit premature for the. But then, uh, after the change of government in our okay, we have achieved a tremendous progress in terms of uh, addressing uh, laborers and things like that, uh, which created uh, uh, an environment conducive to do something. Uh, like the uh, trial. So, yes, um, summit uh, was dependent on the uh, improvement of bilateral relations between. But once this summit was held, I think we can expect uh, the trilateral process having a positive impact on bilateral. Uh, relations as well, which means that we are, we can expect a sort of virtuous cycle created by the uh, the start of uh, our trial summit. Why? Because um, um, the uh, trilateral co collaboration uh, uh, very much broadened the scope of, of the uh, cooperation uh, taking place in that framework. You know the, the three. Uh, dialogue has, you know, so far been very much focused on North Korea, but now we are talking about the broader issues, and this allow I think the uh, Japanese people, Korean people, to see each other in a different strategic light, and this is only for you know positive uh, effect for for you know uh, improving. Uh, Vision. So we can anticipate, you know, this virtuous cycle um, starting on the basis of the what uh, has been achieved by the leaders in recent time. And as far as the uh, what would be the next step, I think the most important. I think there are two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, the greater coordination between the two alliances, you know, Japan, ROK. No, no, Japan, U.S., ROK, U.S. Those are two alliances which underpin the peace and stability in the region. But because of the uh, uh, you know bilateral difficulties between Japan and ROK, there has been very little coordination between these two alliances. The alliance, two alliances, function more as independently to, to each other. But now we are talking about creating a more greater synergy coordination uh, from these two processes. For instance, we are talking about uh, our multi domain exercise uh, starting, and also sh information sharing, you know, the, the uh, sharing the uh, 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 data, for instance, North Korean missile launch. So you are going to uh, uh, 
uh, see a progress in that direction, I think, which is a huge, huge uh, progress. The other thing is, uh, you know, all the institutional things we have agreed, uh, leaders meeting, uh, but the leaders are not the only, uh, uh, you know, people uh, who are going to have a regular meeting. We're going to have a foreign ministers, a trilateral foreign minister ministers meeting, our defense ministers meeting, uh, commerce ministers meeting, national security advisors meeting. So we we are going to develop a habit of dialogue among the three parties, and which is going to be uh, provide a very uh, important uh, foundation for the further progress uh, in, in the uh, uh, collaboration in, in that framework. So those are two things I think we need to focus on as we uh, move forward. So is that thus broadening the participation to trilateral that supports cooperation, but also expanding the issues mm -hmm. beyond the North exactly. Korea crisis? Exactly. We hope this can create a virtuous circle. Mm -hmm cycle going forward. One concern in international relations is always the strengthening of relations with one group can cause fear mm -hmm. among others. And one part of the cooperation that supports US, Japan, South Korea cooperation mm -hmm. is a, a shared concern with China. And the issues that have broadened include more strategic um, consultation, as you say, sharing information. Um, we could also worry that China views this with fear. And so how do you think that the steps being taken to strengthen trilateral cooperation are going to affect Japan's relationship with China? That's a very interesting question. And, uh, uh, you know, after the current Biden administration's you know, started, uh, we are, you know, deep in, we are stepping up our efforts to to uh, create a sort of community of nations, uh, sharing our values and principles, uh, like a quad, for instance. Uh, and also uh, there's, there has been the increase, increased uh, engagement with the other, uh, you know, parties like Southeast Asia uh, through IPEF for Pacific Islands Initiative. China has been wary of, of these movements. But as far as Trilateral Summit is concerned, there was a very interesting uh, reaction. They, I think there was a, I think uh, after this summit, China has indicated uh, they, 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 they are prepared, ready to proceed with a trilateral uh, dialogue. China, Japan, ROK which has been dormant for several years, you know, uh, partly because of pandemic, but they are uh, uh, immediately indicated that they are, they are ready to resuscitate this process. So um, that has been a very interesting uh, uh, reaction. I, 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 I'm not going to speculate why uh, that has been the case. Uh, but the broader question is how, you know, we, uh, uh, going to address uh, uh, the challenges posed by China, you know, the world broader strategic context, and that is the uh, the most uh, biggest strategic question we've been uh, uh, trying to grapple with. Um, it's a it's going to be a very complex undertaking, I think. Uh, you know, um, I think uh, Secretary Blinken. Um, uh, uh, made a very astute uh, observation when he said there are three aspects to to our relation with China, you know, adversarial, competitive, but and collab collaborative. You know, China is not the uh, um, the one-dimensional military power that the Soviet Union used to be. The second largest economy, deeply integrated in the global economy, and they are in a position to. Uh, make a positive contribution for the resolution of many global issues like climate change. So we, we need to pursue all the all these three three um, avenues of, of engagement. You know, uh, of course adversarial part uh, requires for us to uh, you know uh, step up our uh, deterrent and responsible capabilities. But uh, it's it's important to uh, keep engaging 
China, uh, trying to find stability in their relations. Of course, uh, you know, um, there there will be, uh, you know, speed humps uh, from time to time, you know, for the time being. We are having some difficult conversation about uh, the dis discharge of treated water from Fukushima uh, nuclear plant. Uh, but uh, I think that should not be in the way of uh, our efforts to uh, uh, build uh, um, uh, constructive and stable relations. Uh, As you're worried about deterrence and speed bumps, we do all think about accidents that could happen, especially with territorial conflicts. And do you feel there's a open line of communication to avoid misunderstandings between Japan and China in yeah, and addressing? We have been trying to engage China in, um, in, the, in the efforts to share you know, our concern about certain aspects of, of their behavior. At the same time, we uh, try to work with Chinese authority to prevent, you know, something unexpected, unwanted, you know, deconfliction. Um, I think there has been um, efforts to uh, open the hotline between the uh, 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 the concerned the parties, uh, um, and I think it became operational uh, earlier this year, and so. We, uh, uh, of course, we look forward to, to expanding this dialogue from the mere deconfliction to, to broader issues, you know. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's a start, and we look forward to uh, continuing to, to engage Chinese uh, counterparts in these efforts. Wonderful. Well, as a scholar of uh, international trade politics, mm. I cannot resist the opportunity <laughs> to ask you to comment on Japan's leadership in the area of trade policy, mm -hmm. where it has been quite remarkable for me to watch Japan going from 1980s, the last to sign up for liberalizing trade, to now being the first to push forward trade agreements. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the US helped to design, the US backs away and Japan together with Australia brings to fruition mm -hmm. as the comprehensive progressive trans-Pacific partnership and joins with China in the regional comprehensive economic partnership, yeah. which is a very broad agreement, making new pathways to promote regional integration through lowering rules of origin, establishing some rules on digital trade, if mm -hmm. not strict rules. <laughs> And these steps forward in the trade regime are happening while the United States is really stepping back and not pushing forward new trade agreements. You mentioned IPEF, which is the US um, proposal for an Indo-Pacific economic framework and secure supply chains. Right. What, you know, how is Japan mediating the stresses put on the international trade system with a trade war between the US and China, and now Japan is sort of the leader mm. advocating for a rules-based trade order. Well, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate that the trade, uh, you know, public confidence in free trade has uh, eroded uh, quite a bit, uh, partly because of the disappointment with the globalism, you know, after the uh, uh, Lehman crisis, I think there was a, uh, um, a number of people who, who started to doubt the benefit of trade, you know. Uh, and uh, in the context of US politics, trade has become almost a dirty word. And, uh, but, uh, you know, of course, trade has, you know, econo economic values, just as Adam Smith talked about uh, centuries ago, but it also has a strategic value. And, uh, the, the whole concept of TPP was to uh, create uh, uh, open rule-based, um, uh, you know, development open rule-based trade in, in the most um, dynamic uh, region in the world with the United States at its heart. And uh, I, I think it, 
has been really unfortunate that that strategic um, uh, significance uh, has been lost in in the conversation, political conversation in this country. So, but uh, you know, this this is a reality uh, you have to uh, uh, live with, and it's 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 not enough to simply uh, repeat a mantra of free trade. You know, I think we we need to to uh, make efforts to regain public confidence uh, in, in in trade, uh, which involves you know. Um, Trying to find uh, solutions to certain aspects of people's concern about the the existing trading system, labor standards, the environment. I think those issues need to be addressed. And also, uh, we need to uh, make uh, double deal as more sort of uh, function more effectively. Um, so there are a number of uh, um, uh, challenges ahead. And, and in the meantime, uh, there are areas where we can do, uh, for instance, the IPEP. Uh, some people have been disappointed that uh, you know IPEP doesn't have uh, a, you know market access component, but it does have uh, several uh, interesting components, and uh, uh, we we may be able to get uh, early harvest and, and, for instance, a digital trade, for instance, which is going to be a uh, um, uh, extremely important part of the uh, uh, the new uh, order for trade in the region, and uh, uh, and also through the uh, uh, IPEF uh, debates, we can de deepen the understanding uh, among the other regional parties on the kind of question that need to be uh, addressed. You know. The environment labor standards and so on and so forth. So, I think uh, I think can be a very uh, important um, uh, step forward. So we'll be uh, supporting uh, the U.S. U.S. efforts to to see uh, you know uh, you know early conclusion of, of the negotiations. Uh, but that being said, I I I have to inject you know the sense of urgency because as you uh, mentioned. Uh, in the absence of the U.S. leadership uh, in the trade areas, uh, you know, the China is trying to uh, to to uh, to lead the uh, uh, regional uh, efforts uh, in trade area. Also, you, may, you mentioned, and of course, China is applying for the membership for CPTPP, and uh, once China is in. I don't think the, uh, they are they're happy to accept the U.S. as a federal member in that framework. So uh, the time is not exactly on, the, on, on our side. The other thing is um, because of the uh, breakdown of the free trade principles, there have been you know uh, regrettable abuse of the system, uh, economic coercion. Uh, uh, so uh, you know supply chain. You know, domination, things like that. So we we need to work on uh, these issues as well. So trade has, we have a lot on, on our trade plate. So yeah. look forward to uh, you know uh, deepen the conversation with the uh, American uh, friends on uh, this issue. And the question of is trade laying the groundwork for peace and prosperity or? Making countries vulnerable. Interdependence means that products you rely on, from mm -hmm. masks to semiconductors, are being right. produced right. overseas. And so now we're seeing more and more discussion about questioning interdependence. As you said, in the United States, mm -hmm. a backlash against globalization. It's been fascinating that we don't see as much backlash against globalization in Japan, but there is. I'm sure concern about the deep interdependence between Japan's economy and China's economy. Mm -hmm. And so as Japan considers, it already joined RCEP, it faces this challenge of China wanting to join CPTPP and separate from those agreements, many Japanese companies are deeply invested in, mm -hmm. in China. How uh, do you evaluate 
whether Japan should be reducing its economic dependence on China. There's a small government program with subsidies for firms that were to pull out their investment from China. Japan has joined the semiconductor cooperation with the US and Europe for secure supply chains. What, what steps do you think um, can and should be taken? No, I think uh, China remains a very important uh, economic uh, um, um, partners. Uh, we have a you know significant amount of trade, and we have a big uh, accumulation of investments there. So, as I said in my previous uh, uh, remarks, uh, we look forward to to uh, you know uh, finding some stability in our relations, including the economic and business area. That being said. Um, uh, not only our, our government, but also Japanese companies uh, starting to realize doing business with China carries certain geopolitical risk. So there has been a uh, uh, rethinking of their strategy of doing business abroad. So a lot, lot of companies uh, are talking about China plus strategy, you know, diversifying into other destinations uh, for their investment. But uh, a lot of small to medium-sized uh, companies in Japan cannot afford uh, to do that because you know, they have, have more or less uh, went all in uh, in, in, in China. And also, now China Chinese economy is uh, slowing down. You know, we are talking about uh, four, five percent uh, but still, you have the big market, uh, you know, with the uh, people with a reasonable uh, level of income. So that that's a market that you cannot ignore. And so we need to balance, you know, a lot of competing uh, uh, economic uh, uh, interest, uh, security interest there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are wary of some aspect of the, their behaviors, including economic caution. And uh, as far as the uh, critical, uh, you know, our critical security interests are concerned, we have to be uh, 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 robust in our actions. I mean, export control, uh, try to uh, uh, find the solution to to uh, supply chains. But the question, but uh, you know, again, um, you you remember, you know, back in twenty. 11, 2012, China it banned the export of you know, um, uh, rare to, to Japan. And we, um, government and private sector worked together to, to reduce our dependence of China. And we, we, we have seen some, some success, but our, our dependence went down from 90% to 60%. So it is a half glass full, half empty. You know, it's we 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 could uh, uh, we 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 managed to reduce our dependence by thirty percent, but still we have sixty percent dependence. So it, it's not going to be easy. You know, you, you talk about uh, um, uh, you know economic security, uh, supply chain, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, it. it it uh, bottom line is it has to make a business economic sense, whatever we do. Otherwise, uh, what, whatever we do, it's not going to be sustainable. So there are areas we need to deepen conversation uh, among the, uh, the like-minded partners, including Japan and US. Uh, we have been uh, doing a lot of conversation on this issue. No easy answer. There are difficult issues. In another area where Japan has joined in a like-minded partnership facing high costs is the question of how to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And Japan was among the first nations to line up with the G7 for unprecedented level of financial and trade sanctions. And the Kishida administration, the Japanese public continue to show support for uh, solidarity with Ukraine. Do you think that the Ukraine war, the shock of a major power invading a sovereign United Nations member, 
Has that shock changed perceptions in Japan about its role in the world, the risks that it faces in the world today? And do you think that this will shape how Japan, both the public and the government, are trying to come up with policies to security threats in East Asia? Well, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Ukraine has been uh, 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 the very um, serious reminder that national security is indivisible. What, what has happened in Ukraine could happen anywhere, including Um So to that extent, I think uh, it's contributing um, you know, greater awareness among Japanese people about the uh, fragility of international order and uh, need for Japan to take more proactive uh, 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 actions uh, to to protect their values and principles. And that has been the basis for, for Prime Minister Kishida's efforts to step up our defense efforts. You know, in January, uh, we did Advised uh, three key uh, uh, defense policy instruments, and uh, uh, as you know, we had um, a pledge to to substantially increase our defense investment, uh, uh, bringing the level um, expenditure to to two percent of GDP in five years' time. So that's a big deal. Uh, but I I I I think as as far as the uh, the changing public mindset is concerned, that didn't happen overnight, you know, because of the Ukraine. There was a gradual um, uh, increase in the level of public awareness. And um, I think I credit uh, late Prime Minister Abe uh, for uh, promoting a very serious uh, national debate on uh, Japan's security policy. And uh, so this is a, you know, the change in mindset, I think I would say, um, has been a gradual, gradual uh, uh, evolution. But uh, no doubt, Ukraine has been, uh, has given additional momentum uh, to increase awareness in Germany. And of course, the views on Ukraine are one of many topics where we don't have a consensus in the United States. And so for Japan, dealing with the United States as the primary ally and partner, it <laughs> must be challenging when the U.S. is um, debating critical issues from whether trade with China is in the national interest and whether continued aid to Ukraine is in the national mm -hmm. interest. And so as the United States, from the challenges we see in debates in Congress to an upcoming presidential election, is showing quite a bit of uncertainty about its future leadership direction. How do you as a diplomat translate US politics to the Japanese public to new foreign ministers and prime ministers. What is your role in, <laughs> uh, as a diplomat in a country like the United <laughs> States um, within the realm of what you're allowed to say in a public forum? <laughs> uh, you know, I, a diplomat doesn't usually answer that sort of question. You know. <laughs> uh, we are not supposed to uh, comment on the domestic politics. Uh, that being said, um, I think uh, I, compared with some other ambassadors, I think I'll, I, I'm more relaxed about you know the what is going to happen in the election next year because our experience has been you know uh, there's always a very solid uh, bipartisan support for. And uh, whoever, whichever party is, is in the White House, we can count on uh, continued efforts to strengthen alliance. So uh, I'm not that nervous about who is going to, to, to be. But that's being said, um, I think what is uh, what 
uh, concerns allies and partners uh, around the world is uh, whether uh, the, the United States is going to continue a positive engagement with the uh, global. First, we are saying that it's going to continue to play so the policeman work as a policeman uh, for the whole world. Um, but uh, the uh, American engagement, American leadership uh, is, is needed. Um, so if you, if the analysis disengages, you know, chances are there will be a vacuum. And the, the vacuum uh, will be, uh, 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 can be abused by the So, uh, so whatever the outcome, uh, we are looking forward to continuing uh, uh, to uh, our efforts to ensure uh, United States continues to be engaged. And we are not saying, you know, uh, we are asking the United States to shoulder all the burdens. That's the reason why she doesn't is saying we are, we are stepping out, our, stepping our, our efforts, you know, spending more in defense so that we can create an environment where the uh, the American people feel more comfortable uh, continuing to play a leadership role in, in national uh, society. So I think that is the um, uh, something uh, we will be very much interested uh, as we uh, observe you know, how, how this, this campaign is going to to evolve in the coming month. I'm also interested. <laughs> in my last question, before I open up to our patient audience, I cannot resist the opportunity to ask you as an author of books about great leaders like Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill, what is the role of leadership to shape diplomacy? Yeah. In the Japanese setting, the US, uh, obviously the British is one you've studied greatly. Yeah, I think uh, Churchill and Thatcher played a very interesting role in sort of personalization of diplomacy. You know, Churchill was the first uh, leader, uh, you know, started the, you know, the summit diplomacy, you know, all, you, you remember all the meetings in Cairo, Yalta, uh, and Tehran, and so on and so forth. So he personified, you know, leaders, uh, diplomacy efforts. And Thatcher, interestingly, I think he, uh, he developed Sort of institutional uh, institutional underpinning to personal diplomacy, because he created his own her, she created her own structure in the prime minister's office, so that uh, you know prime minister can play uh, you know diplomatic role without relying on existing institutions like a, you know um, uh, foreign office. So those are two leaders who, who played a very interesting role in what I would call the personalization of diplomacy. But uh, apart from these uh, two examples, I think the, uh, there has been increasing trend toward more greater personalization uh, of diplomacy uh, because the politics has been personalized. Um, politics has become about personalities uh, in, in recent time in, not just in the US, but also in many, many countries. And uh, in such a situation, there are two things which are very important. The first is institution still matters. Because the greater the, the leader's involvement in diplomacy, the greater the risk of misjudgment, miscalculation, and so on and so forth. So we need to have an institution that you know, holds the leaders account accountable, um, ensure transparency, the decision, and so on and so forth. So protecting the institution is very important in this time and age. The second thing which I think absolutely important is keeping the line of communication between leaders. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we always keep, you know, line of communication Open even with um, adversaries, you know, the, because uh, leaders are uh, playing a greater role in in, um, in diplomatic decisions. So, 
you know, think about it. I mean, in the past few years, we have this pandemic, which uh, made it very difficult for leaders to communicate with each other. So during this period, we lost opportunities to directly engage, for instance, President Putin in a very candid conversation. And I'm not saying that, I'm not suggesting that that would have changed the outcome of his uh, decision about Ukraine, but uh, we have to recognize there was a period uh, where we could not send clear direct message to Putin preceding his fatal decision. So I think it's absolutely important to keep you know, proper communication uh, between the leaders. I think those two things, institution and communication, uh, uh, you know, the vital precondition as we, uh, you know, go through the age of uh, personalized uh, diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for fascinating remarks and sharing your wisdom with us. <laughs> I have enjoyed uh, the opportunity to ask questions, but I know the audience is waiting for their chance. And so I'd like to ask everyone to very briefly introduce yourself. You may ask one question, short and brief, so that more people can have a chance to ask their questions. We'll start off with Matt Brummer, from the associate, who is an associate with the program on U.S.-Japan relations and is joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. um, I was hoping that maybe I could ask you about the elephant in the room today. Um, um, Japan has a long diplomatic history with Israel, um, and this relationship has been warming up significantly in recent years, both um, on the trade front and through security agreements. Uh, Japan also has a long history of uh, supporting Palestine and contributing significant aid to the Palestinian National Authority. Um, and so I would like to ask you what role Japan can play uh, in today's a very unstable uh, situation. I know it's a sensitive uh, question, but perhaps there is no one better, uh, quite literally, in the Japanese diplomatic corps to ask this question to than you having served as, as ambassador to Israel and now as the US. Um, what do you think? Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very <laughs> difficult question because I left uh, Tel Aviv uh, almost five years ago. So I, I'm not uh, blessed with what's happening, let uh, uh, alone why this, this situation has, has uh, uh, come about. Um, Yes, we uh, uh, in recent time we have developed a very close uh, economic and business relations with Israel. Um, interestingly, um, that that uh, sort of uh, process coincided with the shift in geopolitical. You know, uh, be, the reason is one of the biggest reasons why Japanese business was was reticent going to Israel uh, was this perception that uh, doing business in Israel will negatively impact their businesses with Arab countries. But as you know, there has been you know significant shift in geopolitical situation. Uh, and you are starting to see rapprochement between Israel and Gulf countries, and which created, which raised the comfort level of Japanese business uh, going to Israel. Uh, and um, very ironically, uh, what's happening today uh, has, I think, much to do with this geographical. Uh, geopolitical shift. And uh, I'm not, you know, uh, no, nothing justifies what uh, has been done by Hamas. You know, I, I'm not uh, uh, trying to provide any justification of their actions, but there has been 
sort of pent up uh, desperation on part of Hamas. You know, their their issue has been marginalized uh, because of this geopolitical shift. So, I I, I thought it's um, uh, all these things are connected. Um, you know, Japanese are going there, and uh, you know, Hamas doing these, these things. Uh, and uh, the question is, <laughs> what Japan can do? And then I don't think there's much we can do in terms of uh, uh, managing the situation right now because we are not a uh, direct party to, to any political uh, process uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians. What we are doing, have we, what we have been doing is to uh, create a sort of uh, environment conducive for uh, progress in, you know, uh, Deconstruction between the two parties, you know. So uh, we have been focusing on raising the economic resilience of Palestinian people. Uh, so we had uh, sort of be in, in Jericho. Uh, we uh, uh, created uh, investment industrial park uh, to to uh, uh, strengthen uh, entrepreneurship of Palestinian people. Palestinian people. So that's sort of. Um, indirect support uh, with a view to creating an environment conducive peace uh, discussion uh, has been Japan's uh, con contribution. Of course, we'll be, uh, uh, be part of the, uh, the international efforts to, to uh, resolve the uh, existing situation. We are the member of the uh, Security Council in the United Nations, so we might be doing some, uh, playing some role in that capacity. But I'm afraid there not there's not much we can do uh, directly to to uh, resolve the situation right now. Other questions? Yes. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm very delighted to, to have uh, this uh, rare and uh, opportunity to make questions and. Uh, I'm associate of the uh, program on U.S.-Japan uh, relations, and uh, after coming to Harvard uh, in the late August, I'm very surprised that the many discussions on China and the possibility of Taiwan contingency uh, have taken place and everywhere and every time at Harvard, and I also take part took part in the last uh, uh, yesterday uh, of the voluntary study group of of the uh, Kennedy School school students, uh, the participants from the US, US Navy and US Air Force and Chinese, Taiwanese, Japanese and Australian. And we discussed about what should we act uh, when Taiwan contingency happened and deteriorate. And yes, and this is the atmosphere and the torrent of I feel that, the, and uh, I feel that the uh, Japan is entering the era of this uh, strengthening the combining of the uh, diplomatic and military uh, strategies. And this, uh, I would like to uh, ask about the uh, Japan and NATO uh, relationship and cooperation. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, you uh, mentioned about the uh, the possibility of the opening the NATO office in Tokyo uh, this year. Uh, as I know that it, it's it, this discussion is become silent and so yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, okay. I think and the question is an important okay. one. Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. And so, how should we uh, uh, combine the uh, proceeding the concept of uh, free and open the Pacific and the uh, the combination of the Japan NATO relations. Yeah, this is the question. No, I think, um, uh, as I said, uh, we are uh, starting to realize that um, uh, national security is indivisible. Um, so I think uh, it's very important for us to. Uh, share uh, our knowledge and concern about the uh, security picture. Uh, so it's important for NATO members to understand what's happening in, you know, in our native neighborhood. 
and it is important for Japan to understand, you know, broader uh, international uh, security challenges that uh, concern NATO members. So uh, we have been uh, trying to deepen our conversation with the NATO members. I think Shida-san went to the, uh, the summit uh, in Madrid last year. I think he was the first Japanese prime minister uh to 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 be there um so there'll be uh, uh, additional efforts to deepen uh, collaboration uh, uh based on the recognition that uh, again uh, security is indivisible we have many hands up mark <laughs> And could the others keep your hands up just a minute so I can see? Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. My name is Mark Wu. I'm a professor at Harvard Law School. Um, while my research is on trade and geopolitics, the question I want to ask you is a different one and much more about people-to-people -people relations. Um, I was a beneficiary 30 years ago of the Mombusho Scholarship, and I think um, there's nothing that builds greater mutual understanding uh, amongst allies than having young people study each other's countries. And I noticed last year or the last couple of years, the number of young Japanese studying in the United States is near an all-time low. Uh, there were 20 times as many Chinese studying in the United States as Japanese. There were three times as many South Koreans studying in the United States as Japanese. And more Japanese chose to study in Canada than in the United States. Um, I just want to ask you, um, what advice do you have for us in U.S. higher education about a why, how we can make the United States a more attractive place for young Japanese to come study and hopefully build the next generation of relationships that I know you and I have both benefited from, from having the chance to study abroad and understand each other's societies? Thank you. Well, I uh, give you a very simple advice. Reduce your tuitions. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a joke. That's a, the sim, single biggest issue why there are few and fewer Japanese students coming here to study. Because uh, uh, when I studied at Davidson, tuition was in thousand. Um, but nowadays, the Japanese parents simply cannot afford to send their kids. Uh, and they have limited access to scholarship. So that's the reason why you know, students are going to other destinations like Canada, you know, really, uh, but they're not the United States because they're too expensive. But uh, the Korean families would suffer the same well, they challenges. Have <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just overstating uh, the economic aspect. Of course, there are other aspects. And first of all, uh, we, uh, we have big demographic challenge. We are having less, less, students, you know, of uh, and of course, uh, um, it's, uh, I think we need to uh, um, start uh, considering what sort of support we can give uh, to make sure that the more Japanese students, uh, uh, you know, come to this, this country. So uh, I'll be uh, working with the other stakeholders to, to create an environment uh, where we have more amenable uh, environment for, you know, the, the environment where Japanese parents and students feel more comfortable coming here. Um, but a tuition is a big issue, I must, uh, I must, I must say. I also need to make sure we get out more information about the generous financial aid opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you again so much for coming to talk to us today. I'm Akib. I'm a student at the college. And we kind of touched on supply chains and semiconductors and those sorts of emerging technologies. Yeah. So if you could just kind of expand upon, um, you know, Japan and the U.S. collaborating on companies like Rapidus and these kind of collaborations, uh, what are the concrete objectives that Japan's trying to achieve for its own domestic semiconductor industry? And how can we expect these to be different from efforts in the past decades that have kind of fell short or not reached their objectives? No, well, that's the uh, kind of questions we've been trying to grapple. I mean, we've been grappling with. Um, 
you know, uh, recently uh, we created a uh, new uh, mechanism of consultation at the minister's level. We we now have economic two plus two. Uh, we used to have you know two plus two defense minister, foreign minister, but now we have a you know uh, two plus two uh, foreign minister and, and commerce minister, you know, meti minister from Japan. That shows you how the issue of economic security has become very important. So, so uh, and of course, semiconductor uh, is uh, is um, uh, one of the focal point of our discussions. Uh, but that being said, I, I come back to the point I made earlier. You know, whatever we do, it has to make a business sense. You know. So it doesn't make a business sense trying to, uh, you know, produce every kind of chips, you know, uh, to to try to have indigenous capacity to build all the, the whole range of chips, you know. So you, and uh, it also applies to export control. You know, we 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 have to be um, uh, discriminating in what sort of technology uh, need, need need needs to protect it. Uh, what sort of technology we can share with the uh, the other countries? So, figuring out all these uh, uh, parameters uh, is a very complex uh, undertaking. Um, but as far as Japan is concerned, we are, uh, are trying to uh, regain our leadership role in global, you know, um, uh, semiconductor production, and uh, I think we we want to concentrate on the cutting edge uh, uh, technology, semiconductor technology. Um, and we, we cannot do it uh, on our own, you know, if you try to, to make uh, uh, progress in that area. So we are looking forward to, to working with the US government, US business, uh, you know, Rapidus uh, is trying to forge, uh, you know, cooperation with the uh, some of the leading companies here so we need a lot of in in national collaboration uh to to uh, to uh, regain our you know competitive edge vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh the yeah. uh, one last question in the room and i'm also going to first read the two online and we'll ask you to pick and choose how you would like to respond to the three <laughs> last questions right. so i have online david bowling asking about how the fukushima issue that you briefly referenced is likely to be solved and whether the upcoming meeting between japan south korea china in december is potentially an area where that fukushima water issue could be solved and Professor Rockford Witz of Tufts University asks you to talk about the Arctic Ocean, where Russia, China are increasingly um, expanding their influence. And he asks about Japan's partnership with the US for collective Naval Coast Guard presence in the Arctic. Two tough questions, but you've been patiently waiting in the back, standing through our session. So please go ahead and introduce yourself and ask our last question in the room. Did I miss you? I thought you had your hand up. No? Okay. Who was the next person with a hand up then? Yes. Hello, Ambassador. My name is Hina Kwan. I'm a visiting scholar at the Harvard Asia Center and also a journalist from Germany. Uh, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, I think it's an amazing opportunity to uh, listen to someone who has so many valuable personal experiences as a diplomat. My question is, what are, as someone who has lived in so many different countries and who has served um, as a diplomat for so many centuries, um, what are the major um, shifts uh, in your work as a diplomat and also maybe in diplomacy as a means of communication? The greatest challenge, can you solve Arctic cooperation? <laughs> the Fukushima question? Uh, and diplomacy in practice. It, 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 I have to be careful about you know what I say about Fukushima, but uh, it's, it's it's something we have to do. You know, in order to decommission reactors, and the leave Fukushima uh, as they have 
the co completely irresponsible, you know, thing to do. So we need to um, handle the, the water coming out of this, this place um, so that we could uh, um, move on to, to make progress, uh, the very difficult process of decommissioning. So, so that is a starting point. And um, uh, this is uh, something we have to do. It's the first point. Then, then um, you know, we have been trying to uh, find the best solution. Uh, you know, we, we uh, looked at a number of options uh, uh, to dispose uh, this, this water. And uh, this is what we are, um, do, what we are doing is, is the, um, something we reached as a best available option based on the best scientific advice. And we have been working very closely with the Redamani National Organization, um, uh, IAEA, uh, and we have, uh, you know, strong endorsement from that organization that this is, uh, you know, something uh, uh, which conforms to international accept acceptable uh, international standard, and it has negligible uh, impact on the human health as well as the oceanic environment. So, um, but I I think it. We recognize that it's incumbent on us to ensure, uh, you know, uh, continued monitor the situation uh, while keeping a complete transparency. Uh, what's happening in uh, Fukushima? Uh, that's something we are, we are going to do. But uh, this is going to continue. <laughs> this is not. Uh, the process will drag on for many. Unfortunately, that. But again, I come back to the point, you know, not doing nothing is totally irresponsible, uh, not only for the uh, Japanese public, but all, for the uh, national society as well. So this is something we have to do uh, in a way that conforms to international standard and uh, uh, conforms to, uh, um, uh, to, to the best way to alleviate uh, the public concern in and out of Japan. Uh, Arctic, uh, I'm not exactly an expert, uh, uh, but uh, we recognize this is a very important uh, um, uh, uh, challenge. And, uh, you know, uh, depending on how we uh, can uh, utilize that area, it can be a game changer for, for many, many aspects, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, global traffic, uh, uh, exploitation resources, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, we'll be part of the, uh, uh, the international efforts to find, uh, you know, appropriate uh, 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 way to 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 exploit what uh, that region can offer to us. And by the way, uh, uh, our new minister Kamikasa has has a very strong interest uh, uh, in this issue. So uh, uh, I think we are looking forward to a very robust efforts under new minister. Uh, diplomacy, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been to many places, but I love this job because I have a very short attention span. <laughs> so the best thing about this job is every two, three years, you have a complete change of scenery. Uh, <laughs> but what, what uh, uh, changes I've observed, of course, uh, um, when I uh, joined the foreign service, there's no smartphone, there's no uh, even word processors. Uh, I was, uh, you know, writing um, minister's brief, you know, so the, 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 the most important quality needed for the freshman new entrant is to have a, you know, good penmanship. Otherwise, I think you, as long as you write something easy, <laughs> minister can read. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of a very uh, strict uh, um, uh, dressing down. So, but, uh, you know, the technology has changed. But uh, 
I think nothing has changed in a very critical way uh, about this diplomacy because diplomacy is, is basically an exercise in human relations. It comes down to the human connection, how to how to how you make connection uh, with not just your counterpart, but uh, you know people like yourselves. Uh, and come here to try to to make a connection, and that is the basis for diplomatic, uh, you know, debate discussions and so on and so forth. So that critical element, you know, the diplomacy being the exercise in human relations has hasn't changed, and I don't think it's going to change. Uh, whatever technology we have, I mean, of course, uh, I. I um, I'm tempted to to uh, use the chat GPT, you know, to uh, to write a report to Tokyo. <laughs> Maybe uh, they could write a better report. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us in person to make the connection and share your ideas. It's been a great honor and pleasure to have you with us. Please thank, thank you. you.